The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So John is going to present uh, Project 3, Beta. All right, so uh, here's the performance grades. Um, in general, this submission went a lot better than last time in that things were on time and nobody failed to build or forgot to uh, add files to their project or so on. Um, we did change the scoring mechanism a little bit. In the, uh, in the M driver that we gave you, if your validator failed you on any of your traces, your score is a zero. Um, in this one, we decided to be nicer. We replaced your validator with our correct validator. And for traces that you failed, you get a zero for the points that those traces contribute. But you did get an overall partial score, if you, even if you failed a couple traces. So uh, on that note, the reference implementation does get a 56 on this score. And there were people who had s slower than reference implementations that uh, landed below 56, so that might be something to think about for your final submission. Um, the high score was a 96, and there were actually quite a few uh, groups in the 90s, so overall people did really well on this. Um, with that said, your validators didn't really, eh, I guess they were okay, but uh, there's uh, some people whose validators failed uh, projects that were correct and other people whose validators failed to detect certain situations. So that's also something to work on for the final. We won't be releasing the stock validator, so it'll be up to you guys to find out what's wrong with your validators and fix them. And along the same lines of correctness, once again, for the final submission, we'll be running, actually, even for the beta, I believe, we're going to val grind your projects and look for uh, memory errors. So. Uh, do that to your own projects and investigate any messages you get. Okay, so uh, the uh, the highlighted column number 31 uh, refers to the uh, reference implementation of the validator. So that's the authority. If that's green, then your implementation is correct. And so hopefully, and a correct validator would agree with column 31. Yes. How can it be that most of, like, so an implementation is vertical, right? So tests are horizontal? No, the, the implementations are horizontal and the tests are vertical. So we want our columns to look like column 31, or we want our columns to all be... You right? want your, your validator's correctness score will be determined by... Ooh, cool. Your validator's correctness score will be determined by whether or not your column number uh, corresponds with column 31. And then your implementation's correctness will purely be determined by whether 31 marks your row red or green. Does that make sense? That's right. That's correct. Whereas the rows that are green, that's what we like to see. We like green rows. And then we like columns that match column 31. Right, that's, that's correct. correct. Whatever error this person had, uh, very few validators seems to have caught them, which is very surprising because what we did for your validator.c is that we removed the line of code that it contained and we added a comment that explained in English exactly what that line of code did. So it was kind of interesting to see that not everybody came up with a validator that's identical to the reference one. Okay. Yeah, so uh, please run Valgrind on your code before the final submission. And we'll be uh, pushing actual, your, your personalized results to your repos sometime probably by the end of the day, either today or tomorrow. Great. Well, you can take this to the, or you can give it to Reed. Here you go. 
you guys can have it here in case you need to chip in. Okay, uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, programming in parallel, parallel programming and so forth. So this is, I'm sure, what you've all been waiting for. Oops. Oh, we're not, we have no power here. Here we go. There we go. Now I got power. Okay. Let me see here. How's that? Good. Okay. So we're talking about multi core programming. And uh, uh, let me start with a little bit of um, history. Um, so um, since the mid to late 1960s, so how many years is that? 50 years, wow, okay. Um, semiconductor density has been increasing at the rate of about, uh, it's been doubling about every 18 to 24 months. Okay, so every, uh, every year, uh, every, uh, you know, one to two years, every, uh, you know, 18, year and a half to two years, we get a doubling of density on the chips. And uh, that's a trend that still is continuing. Okay, so that's called Moore's Law, the doubling of density of integrated circuits. And so this is basically a curve showing uh, how transistor count is rising. Okay, so all these green things are, are uh, Intel CPUs and what the transistor count is on them. Yeah, question. What does that mean to mine some curve further So there have been some technology changes along the way. Um, so uh, in particular, that one, no, the E-beam transition is back down here, I think. I don't remember which one that is. Well, this is, this is actually a different one. What we're looking at right now is the transistors, which have been very smooth, okay? So I'll explain this curve in a minute. So there's two things plotted on here. One is the Intel CPU uh, uh, density, and the other is what the clock speed of those processors is, okay? And so these are the clock speed numbers, okay? And so the integrated circuit technology has been, uh, uh, the density has been doubling, and it's really a, a, an unbelievable sort of social and economic um, process that this has basically been called a law, okay? Because what happens is uh, if a, uh, there's so many people that contribute to making integrated circuits be dense, there's so many pieces of technology that go into that. And what happens is if you decide that you're gonna try to jump and try to make something that goes faster than Moore's Law, what happens is that it's more expensive for you to do it, and no, none of the other uh, participants in that economy can keep up, and you're just gonna be more expensive. So people will opt for the cheapest thing that gets the uh, factor of two every 18 to 24 months, okay? Whereas if you're behind, then nobody uses your, your stuff. So everybody's got this sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that the rate at which the density is increasing has just been extremely stable for over 50 years. It's, it's remarkable. Yeah, question. You're saying that it's for 50 years. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that, that there is some amount of, of um, everybody expecting that this is the point that everybody is going to be at. And so if you want to, if, if you try to go more aggressively than that, you can get burned because you'll be more expensive. If you don't go that fast, you're going to get burned because nobody's going to adopt your particular piece of the technology. And so what happens is everybody sort of settles for this, you know, regularly repeating. It's a, it's a remarkable social and economic phenomenon. 
okay, you know, that's got very little to do at some level of technology. It's just that we know that we can improve things. But this, this, what's amazing is this growth has gone through many transitions, such as the transition at one point they said we aren't going to be able to build uh, integrated circuits any more uh, densely because all of the masks that were made, uh, it's basically you make uh, computers with a photographic process, okay, of exposing and uh, using, um, you know, masks that you shine light through, okay, is the way they used to do it. And what happened was the wavelengths of light were such that you were just simply not going to be able to get the resolutions. So what did they do? They switched to e-beams, okay, electrons rather than photons to expose the, uh, the silicon wafers and so forth. And so th they've gone through a whole bunch of transitions and different technologies, and yet throughout all of that, it's been just a, a you know, very steady progress at about the rate of 18 to 24 months per uh, doubling of density. And that is still going on and is projected to go on maybe for 10 years more. It's going to run out in, um, I hope, in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, and certainly within, um, uh, within your lifetimes. So, so that has been going. Then there's a second phenomenon that has been going on since, um, uh, since about uh, 19, mid-1980s. And that is that the, the clock speed has actually been growing on a similar curve, okay, where basically we've been getting 30% faster uh, 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 processors, clock speed, uh, since the mid-1980s. But something happened there, which was in around 2003, it flattened out, okay? And the reason is, and, and as, an, you know, as a practical matter, clock speed for air-cooled systems is bounded at somewhere around 5 gigahertz. If you want to liquid cool it or nitrogen cool it or, you know, liquid nitrogen cool it or something, you can make it go faster. But basically the problem is that, uh, that things get too hot and they cannot convey the heat out. So for a while, if you had greater density, the transistors get smaller, they switch faster, and you can make the clock speed go faster. But at some point, they hit the wall. And so there the vendors were, people like Intel, AMD, Motorola, uh, a variety of the semiconductor manufacturers. And what's happened is they can still make integrated circuits more and more dense, but they can't clock them any faster. Okay, so here's a, um, what's going on in the circuit. So here's essentially uh, how much power was being dissipated by a variety of Intel processors along the way. And what they saw in 2000, they started getting hot and hotter until if they just continued this trend, okay, they were going to be trying to, uh, uh, you know, have junction temperatures that are as hot as the surface of the sun. Well, th they clearly couldn't do that, okay? So you might say, well, let's put it off a few years. Yeah, but how many years are you going to put this off? And so what happened was they got stuck. They, they simply could not make uh, chips get clocked any faster. So what did they decide to do? They've got all the silicon area, but they can't make the processors faster with it. So their solution was to scale performance to put many processing cores on the microprocessor chip. So this is an example of a core i7. It's a four core, one, two, three, four cores uh, processor. We actually have six core machines now, but I didn't update the, the uh, figure. Um, and uh, what's going to happen now is Moore's Law is going to continue for a few more years. And so it looks like each new generation of Moore's Law is going to potentially dub double the number of cores per chip. Okay, so we have, you know, you folks are using 12-core machines, two six-core uh, uh, chips. Well, that's going to basically keep increasing. And so we're going to get more and more cores per chip. Okay, that's all well and good, but it turns out that there's a, uh, a major issue, uh, and that's software. 
everybody has written their software and there's billions and billions and billions of dollars invested in existing legacy software that's written for how many cores? One. And moving it to multi-core is a nightmare for these companies, okay? And it's potentially a nightmare for these vendors because if people say, gee, you can't make the processors go any faster, why should I buy a new processor? My old processor is good as my new one, okay? And so, so anyway, so that's sometimes been called uh, the multi-core challenge, the multi-core menace, you know, the uh, multi-core revolution, you know, whatever. But that's what it's all about. It's all about the issue of the frequency scaling of the clocks versus uh, Moore's law, which talks about what the density is. Okay. So their solution is to, is to do it. And so what we're going to talk about for a bunch of the rest of the term is going to be uh, how do you actually program multi-core processors. We're going to look at some fairly new software technology for doing that. So uh, here's an abstract multi-core architecture. Um, it's not, as, it's not uh, precise because we've only shown one level of cache. So we have processors connected to a cache. In fact, of course, you know that there are um, multiple uh, levels of cache. Yeah, this is the uh, international symbol for cache if you live in the US. <laughs> OK. So, um, so the processors have their cache. Of course, you know that what actually happens is you have multiple levels of cache, and it's shared cache at some levels, okay? So it's more complex than this. But this is sort of an abstract way of sort of understanding a bunch of the issues. And then, of course, they only get more complicated as we look at reality, okay? As you know with all these uh, uh, hardware-related things, okay? And so this is a chip multiprocessor. Now, there are other ways of using the silicon. So another way of using the silicon is building things like graphics processors and using silicon for a very special purpose uh, things so that you can, instead of saying let's build multiple processors, you can say let's dedicate some fraction of the uh, silicon real estate instead of to general purpose computing, let's dedicate it to some specific purpose like graphics, okay, or some kind of stream processing uh, or what have you, okay, sensor uh, processing, a uh, variety of other things you could do it. But one main trend is doing chip multiprocessors. So we're going to talk a little bit about shared memory hardware, just enough to get you folks off the ground, uh, to understand sort of what's going on underneath the system. And then we're going to talk about four concurrency platforms, which are um, not the only platforms one can program in, but, um, uh, but they're ones that you sort of should be familiar with. The last one, Silk++, is the one we're going to do our uh, programming assignments in. Okay? And uh, then... Um, uh, race conditions we're going to talk about because that's the biggest thing that comes up when you do parallel programming compared to ordinary serial programming. It's the most pernicious type of bugs, and you need a way to you need to understand race conditions and need a way of um, of handling it. So here's basically um, so we'll start with shared memory hardware. Okay, so. Um, so the main thing that shared memory hardware provides is a thing called cache coherence, okay? And the basic idea is that you want every processor to be able to fetch stuff out of local caches because that's fast, okay? But at the same time, you want them to have a common view of what is stored in a given location. So let's run through this example and see what the problem is, and then I'll show you how they solve it in kind of sketchy detail. Okay? So, um, so here's a processor that says he wants to load the value of x, and in main memory here, x has got the value of 3 up here in DRAM. Okay? So x moves through to the processor where it gets consumed, and it leaves behind the fact that x equals 3 in its local cache. Okay? Well, now along comes the second processor says, I want x2. And perhaps the same thing happens. Okay? Very good. So far, no problem. So two caches may have the same value of x. OK? 
okay, may both want to use X, and it's both in their local caches. Now comes along the third processor, says load X as well. Well, it turns out that it's actually, the, what I showed you on the second case is not the common case. If these two processors, these two processing cores are on the same chip, it's generally cheaper for this guy to fetch it out of this, one of these guys' caches than it is to fetch it out of DRAM. DRAM is slow, getting it locally is much cheaper. So basically, in this case, he gets it from, from uh, this processor, the first processor. Okay, all is well and good. They're all sharing merrily around, okay? And then this fellow decides, uh, oh, if he wants to load it, no problem. He can just load it. He loads it locally, no problem, okay? And this guy decides, oh, he's going to store some value to X. In this case, he's going to store the value 5. So he sets X equal to 5. Okay, fine. Okay, now what? Now this guy says, let me load X. He gets the value X equals 3. Uh-oh. If your parallel program expected that this guy had gone first and had set X value X equals 5, these guys are now incorrect. Okay, and so the idea of cache coherence is not letting this happen, making it so that whenever a value is changed in, uh, by a processor, the other processors see that change, and yet they're still able most of the time to execute effectively out of their own local caches. Okay, so that's the problem. So do people understand basically what the cache coherence problem is? Yes, question. The last processor was to store x and says x equals 5. Wouldn't that, like, as soon as that happens, wouldn't that write in DRAM x equals 5? Why Good. Is so, so there's actually two types of strategies that are used in caches. One is called uh, write through, and one is called write back. What you're describing is write through. What write through caches do is if you write a value, it pushes it all the way out to DRAM. These days, nobody uses write through. It's too, you're always going to DRAM. You're always exercising the DRAM, uh, the slow DRAM, versus being able to just write it locally, okay? But you do have to ha do something about these guys that are gonna have uh, the shared values. So here's the mechanism that they use. So what most people do these days is write back caches, which basically means you only write it back when you really need to evict it or or uh, what have you. Okay, you don't write it, you don't always write it all the way through. And so here's how these schemes work. So right, so that's, um, yeah, that's a bogus value to be getting, for that guy to be getting. Okay, so let's take a look. So what they use is what's called, the simplest is called an, a, uh, an MSI uh, protocol. There are somewhat more complicated ones called MESI protocols and ones that are MOESI Moisi and Messi and anyway, the Messi one is probably the one you'll hear most often. It's just a little bit more complicated than this one, but uh, it saves you in um, the case that you're doing a, um, it saves you one extra access when you do a write. I'll explain it in just a minute. But let's first understand the simplest of these mechanisms. Okay, so what you do is in each cache, you're gonna label each cache line with a state. And basically, it's, it's because of these states that you associate with the cache line, the cache lines end up having to be long, okay? Because, you know, you'd like to, if you think about it, you'd like cache lines to be, a, at some level, very short, in that then you have more opportunity to have just the stuff in cache that you want for, from a temporal locality point of view. It's one thing if you want to bring in extra lines extra data for spatial locality, but to insist that it all be there whether you access it or not, that's not clear how helpful that is, okay? However, what instead is we have things like on the Intel architecture, 64 bytes of, uh, of cache line. And the reason is because they're keeping extra data with each uh, cache line, and they want the data to be the larger fraction of what they're keeping compared to the control information about the data. So in this case, they're keeping three values, three bits. The M bit says this bl cache block has been modified. Somebody's written to it. And what they do is they, in this protocol, they 
guarantee in the protocol that if somebody has it in the M state, no other caches contain this block in either the M state or the S state. Okay? So what are those states? So the S state is when other caches may be sharing this block. And the I state is that this cache black is invalid. It's the same as if it's not there. It's empty entry. Okay, so it just says, it just marks this entry. There's no data there. Okay, the, the, the cache line that's there is not really there. Okay, it's basically what it says. So here you see, for example, that uh, this fella has uh, x equals 13 in the modified state. And so if you look across here, oh, nobody else has it in either the M or the S state. They only have it in the I state or not at all, okay? If you have it in the shared state, as these guys have, well, they all have it in the shared state, and notice the values are all the same, okay? And then if it's in the invalid state here, this guy once again has it in the uh, modified state, which means these guys don't have it in either the S or M state. So that's the invariant. So what's the basic idea behind the cache, uh, the MSI protocol? The idea is that before you can write on a location, you must first invalidate all the other copies, okay? So whenever you try to write on something that's shared across a bunch of things or that somebody else has modified, what happens is over the network goes out a protocol to invalidate all the other copies. So if they're just being shared, that's no problem because all you do is just have them drop it from the cache, okay? If it's modified, then it may have to be written back or the value brought back to you so that you're in a position of changing it. If somebody has it modified, then you don't have it, so therefore you need to bring it in and, and uh, make the change to it. Question? You said there were three bits, but there are three states. Three states, not three bits. Two bits, right, okay. Um, so the idea is you first invalidate the other copies. Therefore, when a processor core is changing the value of some variable, it has the only copy, okay? And by making sure that it only has the only copy, you make sure that you never have copies out there that are anything except copies of what, uh, of what everybody else has, okay? That they're all the same, okay? Does that everybody follow that? So that's basically, so there's hardware under there doing that. It's actually pretty clever hardware. In fact, uh, the verification of cache protocols is, uh, is a huge problem for which uh, there's a lot of uh, technology built to try to verify to make sure these cache protocols work the way they're supposed to work. Because what happens in practice is there are all these intermediate states. What happens if this guy starts doing this while this guy is doing that? And, you know, these protocols start getting mixed and so forth, and you gotta make sure all that works out. And that's what's going on in the hardware. The, the MESI protocol does a simple optimization. It says, look, before I store something, I probably wanna read it. It's likely I'm gonna read it. So I can read it in two ways. I can read it in a way that says that it is, um, that uh, where it's just gonna be shared, but if I expect that I'm going to write it, let me, when I read it, instead of getting a shared copy, let me get a, uh, an exclusive copy, and that's where the E comes from. Let me get an exclusive copy. In other words, go through the invalidation protocol on the read so that with the expectation that when you write, you don't have to then wait for the invalidation to occur at that point. So it's a way of getting, uh, reducing the latency of the protocol. Okay, by getting it exclusively by the read that you do before you do the write. Okay, so rather than doing a read, which would go out and get the value, okay, and you know, but everybody has it in shared, then doing the write and don't, then doing a whole invalidation protocol, if I basically get it in exclusive mode on the read, then I go out, I get the value, and I invalidate everybody else, now I've just saved myself half the work and half the latency or basically save myself some latency, not have to latency. Okay? So, um, so basically, this what you should know is there's invalidation stuff going on behind when you start using shared memory behind the scenes, okay? Which can slow down your processor. 
okay, from, from executing because it can't do the things that it needs to do until it goes through, uh, through the protocol. Any questions about, uh, about that? That's basically the level we're going to cover um, uh, uh, the, the, the hardware um, at. And so you'll, you'll discover that in doing some of your problems that if you're not careful, you're going to create what are called invalidation storms where you have a whole bunch of things that are, are read and they're distributed across the processor and then you go in and you set one value and suddenly, gee, how come that wasn't a fast store? Well, the answer is it's going through and invalidating all those other copies. Okay? Good. So let's turn to the real hard problem. So it turns out that building these things is, is uh, not particularly well understood, but it's understood a lot better than programming these beasts. Okay? And so we're going to focus on some of the um, uh, strategies for programming. So um, it turns out that trying to program the processor cores directly is painful and you're liable to make a lot of errors. Okay, as we'll see, because we're going to talk about um, races uh, soon. And so the idea of a current currency platform is to do some uh, level of abstraction of the processor cores to handle uh, synchronization and communication protocols and, and often to do things like load balancing. Okay, so that, so that the work that you're doing can be moved across from processor to processor. And so here are some examples of concurrency platforms, pthreads, and WinAPI threads, we're going to talk more in detail about pthreads is basically um, for Unix type systems like Linux and such. Uh, WinAPI threads is for Windows. Uh, there's threading building blocks, TBB, uh, OpenMP, which is a standard, and Silk++. Those are all examples of uh, concurrency platforms that make it easier to program uh, these parallel machines. So I'm going to do as an example, uh, I'm going to use the Fibonacci numbers, which you um, uh, have seen before, I'm sure, because uh, we've actually um, even used it in this class, okay? Um, this is uh, Leonardo de Pisa, who was also known as Fibonacci. And uh, he introduced, he was ba the most brilliant mathematician of his day, came basically out of the blue, doing all kinds of beautiful mathematics, uh, very early in the Renaissance, you recognize, you know, 1202 is very early Renaissance. And, um, uh, but it turns out, for those of you of Indian descent, uh, the Indian mathematicians had already discovered all this stuff. So, um, uh, but it didn't make it into Western culture except for uh, Leonardo de Pisa. So here's a program as you might write it in uh, C. Okay, so, um, so fib int n says, well, if n is less than 2, return n. So if it's 0 or 1, we return fib of 0 is 0, fib of 1 is 1. And otherwise, we compute fib of n minus 1, compute fib of n minus 2, and return the sum. Simple recursive program. Here's the main routine. We get the argument from the command line and print out, compute the result, and then print out Fibonacci of whatever is whatever. Okay, pretty simple piece of code. So what we're going to do is take a look at what happens in each of these th four uh, plat concurrency platforms to see how it is that they make this easy to run this in parallel. Okay? Now, just a disclaimer here. Um, this is a really bad way, I hope you all recognize, of computing Fibonacci numbers, right? So, uh, you know, this is an exponential time algorithm. And you all know the linear time algorithm, which is basically computed up from the bottom. And some of you probably know there's a logarithmic time algorithm based on squaring matrices, two by two matrices. So, um, so in any case, uh, the, um, uh, you know, we're all about performance here, but Obviously, this is a really poor choice to do performance on, but it is a good didactic example because it shows sort of the structure and the issues that you get into in, in doing this um, with a very simple program that I can fit on a slide. Okay, so when you execute Fibonacci, uh, when you call fib of four, it calls fib of three and fib of two. And fib of three calls fib of two and fib of one, and fib of 
uh, one just returns, two goes two, calls two, one, zero, et cetera. And so you basically, you get a, um, uh, an execution trace that basically corresponds to a walk of this tree. Okay, so if you were doing this uh, in C, you'd basically call this, call this, call this, get a value return, call this, add the two values together, return here, call this, add the two values together, call the, you know, return there, and so forth. You walk that using a stack, a uh, call stack in the execution. Um, the key idea for parallelization is, well, gee, uh, fib of n minus one and fib of n minus two are really, in this calculation, completely independently calculated. So let's just do them at the same time, okay? And, uh, you know, they can be executed at the same time without interference because all they're doing is basing it on n. They're not using any shared memory or anything even for this particular program. So let's take a look to begin with how pthreads might do this. So pthreads is a uh, standard uh, that um, uh, ANSI and the IEEE have uh, established for, um, and I actually believe this is a little bit out of date. I believe there's now a 2010 version. I'm not sure, um, but I recall that they were working on a new version. But anyway, this is a recent enough standard. It's a standard that has been revised over the years, uh, the so-called um, POSIX standard. So you'll hear P threads is basically POSIX threads. Um, it's basically what you might characterize as a do-it-yourself concurrency platform. It's kind of like assembly language for parallelism, okay? It allows you to do the things you need to do, but you're sort of doing it all by hand, one step at a time. Uh, it's built as a library of functions with special non-C or C++ semantics. So, um, uh, and, and we'll look at what some of those semantics are. Uh, each thread implements an abstraction of a processor, uh, which are multiplexed onto the machine resources by the pthread runtime implementation. Uh, threads communicate through shared memory, and uh, library functions mask the protocols involved in interthread coordination. So you can, uh, you can uh, start up threads, et cetera, in their library function for doing that. So let's just see how that works. So here are the, basically the two important um, pthread uh, functions. There are actually a whole bunch of them because they also provide a bunch of other facilities. Uh, one is pthread create, which creates a pthread, and one is pthread join, okay? So let's see, so pthread great, create basically takes a, uh, uh, basically is return an identifier. So when you say create a pthread, the pthread system says, here's a handle by which you can name this thread in the future. Okay, so it's a very common thing that the implementer says, here's the name that you get, it's called a handle. So it returns a handle, okay? It then has, uh, uh, has an object to set various thread attributes, and for most of what we're going to need, we're just going to need null for default. We don't need any special things like changing the priority or, or what have you, okay? Then what you pass is a uh, void star pointer to a function, which is going to be the routine executed after creation. So you can name the function that you want to have it operate on, okay? Um, and then you have a single pointer to an argument that you're going to pass to the function, okay? So you can't, when you call something with pthreads to create them, you can't say, and here's my list of arguments. You actually have to, if you have more than one argument, you have to pack it together into a struct and pass the pointer to the struct. And this function has to be smart enough to understand how to unpack it. We'll see an example in a minute. And then it returns an error status. So the most common thing people do is they don't bother to check the error status, okay? And yet, sometimes you try to create a pthread, there's a reason it can't create one, and now you keep going thinking you have one, and then it crashes, your program crashes, and you wonder why, okay? So when you create things, you should check. I'm not sure in my um, code here whether I checked everywhere, okay? But you should check, okay? It's like, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Okay, 
So the other key function is join. And basically what you do is you say, you name the thread that you want to wait for. And this is the name that would be returned by the um, create function. And um, uh, you also give a, uh, a place where it can store the status of the thread when it terminated. So the terminated, you're allowed to, it's allowed to say, I terminated normally, I terminated with a given error condition or whatever. But if you don't care what it is, you just put in null there. Okay, and then it returns the error status of the join function. Okay, so those are sort of the two functions that you program with. Question? It's different. It's different. So it's basically, uh, if it's, if the error status, if it returns null, just means everything went okay. The handle is you, you pass a name, and basically this is star thread. It stuffs the name into whatever uh, you give it, okay? So you're, you're not saying here's the name. This is returned, okay, as an output parameter. So you're giving it a, an address of some place to put the name. Okay, we'll see an example. Okay, so here's Fibonacci uh, with p threads, okay? Uh, so let's just go through that. Um, so the first part is pretty, um, pretty good. This is your original code. Okay, that does Fibonacci, okay? And now what we do is we have a structure for the thread arguments. And so we're gonna have an input argument and an output argument in this example, because fib takes an input argument n and returns, you know, fib of n, okay? So we're gonna call those input and output and we'll call them thread args. And now here is my void star function, okay? Uh, thread func, which takes a uh, pointer, and what it does is uh, when it executes, so what you're gonna be able to do is when you, cre as we'll see in a minute, you're gonna, let, let me just go through this. This is gonna be the function called when the thread is created. So when the thread is created, it's gonna call this function, and what it's gonna get is the, uh, is the argument that was passed, which is the, this void star uh, thing. And what it does in this case is it's basically going to cast the pointer to a thread arg struct, okay, and dereference the input and stick that into i. Then it's going to compute fib of i, and then it's going to take, once again, dereference the pointer as if it's a thread arg and store into the output field the result of the fib, okay? And then it returns null, okay? So that's basically the function that's going to be called when the thread is created. So in your main routine, now, what happens is we initialize a bunch of things, and now if argc is less than two, we'll return one. That's fine, okay? Then we're going to get the, um, uh, meaning that we fail. That's actually the reading of the input. So then what we do here is we get our n from the command line, and then if n is less than 30, we're just gonna compute fib of n. This is what I evaluated on my laptop was a good number, okay? So the idea is there's no point in creating the extra thread to do the work if it's gonna be more expensive than me just doing the work myself. So I looked at the overhead of thread creation and discovered that if it was uh, smaller than 30, there was no point, it's gonna be slower to create another thread to help me out. Right? It's sort of like, you know, you folks when you're, when you're doing pair programming, which you're supposed to be doing versus handing it off. You know, sometimes there's some things that are too small to ask somebody else to do. You might as well just do it, okay? By the time you explain what it is, you know, and so forth. Same thing here, okay? What's the point in starting up a thread to do something else? Because the startup cost is rather substantial. Okay, so if it's less than 30, well, we'll just be done. Otherwise, what we do is we, uh, we marshal the argument to the thread. We basically set args.input to n minus one, okay, because args is gonna be what I'm gonna pass in. So I say the input number is thread minus one, and now what I do is I create the thread by saying, uh, give me the name of the, the um, uh, thread that I'm creating. Uh, this was the, the um, uh, uh, field that I said you could put to be null, which basically lets you set some policy parameters and so forth. I say execute the thread func, this guy here, 
And here's the argument list that I want to provide it, which is this args thing, okay? Once you do the thread create, and this is where you depart from normal C or C++ sem semantics. And in fact, we're going to be doing more moving in the direction of C++. We'll have some um, tutorials on that. Um, what happens is uh, we check the status. Okay, I actually did check the status, okay, to see whether or not it created it properly. Um, but basically now what's happening is after I execute this, it goes off and the, all the magic in pthread starts another thread doing that computation. And control returns to the statement after the pthread create. So when the pthread create returns, that doesn't mean it's done computing the thing that you told it to do, then what would be the point? It returns after it's set up to operate in parallel the other thread. People follow that? So now at this point, there are two threads operating. There's the thread we've called thread, and there's whatever the name of the thread is that we started on, okay? So then we, in our own processor here, we compute fib of n minus two. And now what we do is we go on to join this thread with the thread that is, uh, uh, that we had um, created, okay? And, yep, so let's see here. So we, so we basically, and the thing that the join does is if the other thread isn't done, it sits there and waits until it is done. And it does that synchronization automatically for you. And this is the kind of thing a concurrency platform provides provides the coordination under the covers for you to be able to um, uh, synchronize with it without you having to synchronize on your own, okay? And then once it does return, it adds the results together, okay, uh, by taking the result which came from, um, from the uh, fib of n minus two and adds to it the value that this thread has returned in the args.output. Okay, whoops, and then it prints the result. So any question about that? Wouldn't this be fun to write a really big system in? People do, people do. Yeah, question. That uh, cutoff with the n plus 30. Yeah, now that's, really that's a tuning parameter, that's a voodoo parameter. Right, but in this particular case, it makes no difference at all. It would have made a difference if it was an actual recursive implementation. No, it does make a difference for how fast it computes this. Absolutely does. But it's not recursive. No, that's right. This is not recursive. I'm just doing two things and then quitting. But if it's, if it's less than 30, then it's going to be instantaneous anyway, right? Which is why I, if it's less than 30, it's fast enough that I might as well just return. So why might you not as well just spawn two threads to do it? And it would return very fast as two. No, it would be, but it would be slower. Oh, it be, and wasteful of resources. Maybe somebody well, is spending. Such a bad yeah. Oh, well. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so in any case, um, so that's pthreads programming. There are a bunch of issues. One is that the overhead of creating a thread is about uh, is more than ten thousand cycles. So it leads you to only be able to do very coarse grain concurrency. There are some tricks around that. One is to use what's called thread pools. What I do is I start up and I create a bunch of threads. And I have their names, I put them in a linked list, and whenever I need to create one, rather than actually creating one, I take one out of the list, much as I would do memory allocation, which you folks are familiar with. Okay, ha, 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 <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, so basically you can have a free list of threads, and when you need a thread, you grab the thread, okay? The salient, second thing is, whoop, is um, scalability. So this code gets about a 1.5 speed up for two cores. And if I want to use three cores or four cores, what do I have to do? Rewrite the whole program. This program only works for two cores. It'll also work for one core, okay? But basically it doesn't really exploit three or four cores, okay? It's really bad for modularity. The Fibonacci logic is no longer neatly encapsulated in the fib function, okay? So where do we see, if we go back to this code, here's the fib function. Oh, but now I've kind of got 
uh, well, this is just sort of just marshalling and calling, but over here I've got, oh my goodness, I've got some arguments here. If n is less than 30, I give a result. Otherwise, I'm adding together here. But wait a minute, I already specified fib up here. So I'm specifying my serial implementation and I'm specifying a parallel way of doing it. And so that's not modular. If I decided I wanted to change the, the fib, I've got to change things in two places. Okay, if uh, fib were something I, that, you know, did. Um, uh, code simplicity. The programmers for this are actually marshalling arguments, okay? This is what I call shades of 1958. What happened in 1958 that's relevant to computer science? What was the big innovation in 1958? Programming language. Fortran. So Fortran, before Fortran, people wrote in assembly language, okay? If you wanted to put three arguments to a function, you did a push, 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 or pass them in, in uh, parameters. Actually, th their machines were so much more primitive than that, it was even more complicated than you can imagine, okay? Uh, given, given how complicated it is today, what the compilers are doing, okay? But you had to marshal the arguments yourself. What Fortran did was say, no, you can actually write f of a comma b comma c, close paren, okay? And that will cause a, b, and c all to be marshaled automatically for you. Okay, well, pthreads doesn't have that automatic marshaling. You've got to marshal by hand if you're going to use pthreads, okay? So, um, and of course, as you can imagine, that was error prone, okay? Because, you know, there was no type safety. You know, are you calling things with the right types and so forth and, um, and so forth, okay? And also, you know, if you, and, uh, you know, one of the things here is that we've created two jobs that aren't the same size. So there's no way that they have of sort of load balancing, okay? So, so this is why, you know, pthreads, it's sort of the assembly language level, so you can do anything you want in pthreads, but you have to program at this kind of very protocol-laden level. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is threading building blocks. Um, this is uh, a uh, technology developed by Intel. It's implemented as a C++ library that runs on top of the native pthreads, typically, or WinAPI threads. Okay, so it's basically a layer on top of the pthread layer. The, in this case, the program specifies tasks rather than threads. And tasks are automatically load balanced across the, the threads using a strategy called work stealing, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later. And the focus for this is on performance. They want to write programs that actually perform well. Okay, so here's Fibonacci and TBB. So as you'll see, it's, it's better, but maybe not ideal for what you might like to express. Um, so what we do is we declare uh, the computer, the computation, it's going to be organized as a bunch of explicit tasks. So you name, you say that it's going to be a, a task. And uh, fib task is going to have an input put parameter n and a, an output parameter sum, okay? And what we're going to do is when I, uh, when the task is started, it automatically executes the execute method of this, uh, of this uh, um, uh, tasking object here. And the execute method now starts to do something that looks very much like Fibonacci. It says if n is less than 2, Okay, sum is equal to n, that's what we had before, and otherwise, and now what we're going to do is recursively create two child tasks, which we basically do with a new, this function allocate task, giving it a, uh, the fib task, um, uh, 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 name, where this is basically a, um, a method for, uh, allocating out of a particular type of, um, pool, which is an allocate pool, uh, child pool. And then similarly for B, we recursively do for n minus 2. And then what it does is it sets the number of tasks to wait for. In this case, it's basically two children plus one for bookkeeping. 
okay? So it's always, this ends up always being one more than the things that you created as subtasks, okay? And then what we do is we say, okay, let's spawn. So this only set up the task. It doesn't actually say do it. So the spawn command says actually do this computation here that I set up. So it actually does B, okay, start task B, and then itself it executes A and waits for all of the other tasks, namely both A and B, to finish. And once it's finished, it adds the results together to produce the final output, okay? So this, notice, has the big advantage over the previous implementation that this is actually recursive. So in, in doing fib, you're not just getting two tasks, you're recursively getting each of those two more and two more and two more down to the leaves of the computation. And then what TVB does is it load balances those across the number of available processors, okay? By creating these tasks and then it automatically does all the load balancing of the tasks and so forth. Okay, questions about that? Any questions? We're I don't expect you to be able to program uh, TVB unless I gave you a book and said program TVB, but I'm not gonna do that, <laughs> okay? This is mainly to give you a flavor of what's in there, what the alternatives are. So TBB provides many C++ templates that simplify common patterns. So rather than having to write that kind of thing for everything, for example, if you have loop parallelism, you have n things that you want to have operate in parallel, you can do a parallel for and not actually see the tasks. It covers them over and creates the tasks automatically so that you can just say, you know, for i gets one to n, do this to all i and do them at the same time, essentially. And it then balances those and so forth, okay? It um, also has things like parallel reduce. Sometimes what you want to do across an array is not just uh, do something for every element of the array. You may want to add up all the elements into a single value. And so it basically has what's called a reduction function. It does parallel reduce to aggregate it. And it's got various other things like pipelining and filtering for doing what's called software pipelining where you have one um, uh, uh, subsystem that basically is going to process the data and pass it to the next, which is going to process it and pass it to the next, and allows you to set up a software pipeline of, um, uh, of things. Uh, it also provides what, some container classes such as hash tables, concurrent hash tables, that allow you to have multiple um, uh, uh, um, multiple uh, tasks beating on a hash table, inserting and deleting from the hash table at the same time, and a variety of mutual exclusion library functions, including locks and atomic updates, okay? So it has a bunch of other facilities that uh, make it uh, uh, much easier to use than just using the raw task interface. Okay, OpenMP. Uh, so OpenMP is a specification produced by an industry consortium. Uh, of which the principal players, the original principal player was Silicon Graphics, which um, uh, essentially has become uh, less important in the industry, let's say, put it that way. Uh, and for the most part, recently, it's been uh, players from Intel and Sun, which is now no longer Sun, except that it is Sun part of Oracle, and uh, of, um, uh, IBM, and a variety of other uh, indus industry uh, players. Um, there are several compilers available, uh, both open source and pr proprietary, including GCC has OpenMP built in. And also Visual Studio has OpenMP built in, okay? Uh, these are a set of li linguistic extensions to C and C++ or Fortran in the form of compiler pragmas. So who knows what a pragma is? Okay, uh, good, can you tell us what a pragma is? Yeah, it's kind of like a compiler hint. Okay, it's a way of saying to the compiler, here's something I want to tell you about the code that I'm writing, okay? And, and it basically is a hint Technically, it's not supposed to have any semantic impact, but rather suggest 
how something might be implemented by the compiler. Okay? However, in OpenMP's case, it actually has, they actually have compiler, uh, it does change the semantics in certain cases. Uh, it runs on top of native threads and it supports especially loop parallelism and then in the latest version it supports a kind of task parallelism like open, uh, like we saw with TDD. So in fact, their task parallelism is fairly easy to specify. Uh, so here's the uh, fib code. So now this is not looking too bad, right? Okay, we basically inserted a few lines here and otherwise we actually have the original, the original um, uh, Fibonacci code. So, um, so the sharp pragma says here's a compiler directive and it says the OMP says it is an OpenMP compiler directive. The task says, oh, the following thing should be interpreted as an independent task. And now the sharing of memory in OpenMP is managed explicitly because they're trying to allow for programming both of distributed memory clusters as well as shared memory machines. Okay, and so they explicitly, you have to explicitly name the uh, shared variables that you're using. And uh, here we're basically saying wait for the two things that we spawned off here to complete. So pretty simple, uh, pretty simple code. Uh, it expresses many, provides many pragma directives to express common patterns such as a parallel four for loop parallelization. It also has reduction, it also has directives for scheduling and uh, data sharing and it has a whole bunch of synchronization constructs and so forth, okay? So it's another interesting uh, one to do. The main downside I would say of OpenMP is that the performance is not really very composable. So if you have a program you've written with OpenMP over here, another one here and you want to put them together, they fight with each other, okay? You sort of have to have your concept of what are going to be the uh, programs. The task parallelism helps a bit with, with that, but the basic OpenMP is very much of the model. I know how many cores I'm running on. I can set that and then I can uh, have it automatically parse up the work for those many. But once you've done that, some other job, that, some other part of the system that wants to do the same thing, then you get oversubscription and perhaps some, um, uh, some kind of, nevertheless, a very interesting, um, uh, very interesting system and very accessible because it's um, in most of the standard compilers these days. Um, what we're going to look at is Silk++. Okay, so this is actually a uh, small set of linguistic extensions to C++ to support fork join parallelism. And it was developed by Silk Arts, which is an MIT spin-off uh, which was acquired by Intel uh, last year. So this is now an Intel technology. Uh, and the reason I know about it is because I was the founder of Silk Arts. It was based on 15 years of research at MIT uh, out of my research group, okay? Um, and we won, you know, a bunch of awards actually for this work. Um, in fact, the work stealing scheduler that's in it uh, is provably efficient. In other words, it's not just a heuristic scheduler. It's actually got an, a mathematical proof that it's an effective scheduler. And in fact, is the, ins was the inspiration for things like the work stealing in TBB and the new task mechanisms and so forth in, um, uh, in OpenMP, uh, as well as a bunch of other people who've done work stealing. It, in addition, provides a hyperobject library for parallelizing code with global variables, which we'll talk about later and includes two tools that you'll uh, come to know and love. One is the silk screen race detector and the other is the silk view scalability analyzer, okay? Now, what we're gonna be using in this class is gonna be the, um, uh, the silk plus uh, plus uh, technology that was developed at Silk Arts and then massaged a little bit when it got to Intel. There's a brand new Intel technology with silk built into their compiler, okay? And it is due to come out in like two weeks. <laughs> okay, so it's like, so the, our timing for this was it would have been nice to have you folks on the uh, new Intel Silk Plus technology, but we're gonna go with this one for now. Um, it's not gonna make too big a difference to, to, to you folks, but you should just be aware that coming down the pike, there's actually some very, um, uh, uh, much more cleanly integrated uh, technology uh, 
that you can use that's in the Intel compiler. So here's how we do nested parallelism in Silk++. So basically, this is Fibonacci, and now what I have here is, if you notice that I've got two keywords, silk spawn and silk sync, and this is how you write parallel Fibonacci in silk. This is it, okay? Just, I've inserted two keywords and my program is parallel. The silk spawn keyword says that the named child function can execute in parallel with the parent caller. So when you say x equals silk spawn of fib of n minus one, it does the same thing that you normally think. It calls the child, but rather than, after it calls the child, rather than uh, waiting for it to return, it goes on to the next statement. So then the statement y equals fib of n minus two is going on at the same time as the calculation of fib of n minus one, okay? And then the silk sync says, don't go past this point until all the children you've spawned off have returned. Okay, and since this is a recursive program, it generates gobs of parallelism if it's a big uh, thing. So one of the key things about Silk++ is unlike pthreads, pthreads, when you say pthread create, it actually goes and creates a piece of work. In Silk++, these keywords only grant permission. They say you may execute these things in parallel. It doesn't insist that they be executed in parallel. The program may decide, no, in fact, I'm going to just call this and then return and then execute this. Okay? So, so it only grants permission and the, uh, the Silk++ runtime system figures out how to load balance it and uh, schedule it. Silk++ also um, supports loop parallelism. Okay, so here's an example of an in-place matrix transpose. So I want to take this matrix and flip it on its major axis. Okay? And uh, we can do it with for loops. As you know, for loops are not the best way to do matrix transpose, right? Um, it's better to do divide and conquer. Um, but here's how you could do it, okay? I basically... Uh, and here I made the indices run from zero, not one, because it's, that's the way you do it in the programming. But if I did it up here, then these things get to be n minus one, n minus one, and then it gets too crowded on the slide, and I said, okay, I'll just put a comment there, <laughs> rather than try to sort out. So here's going from, so here's what I'm saying is, this outer loop is parallel. It's going from one to n minus one, and saying do all those things in parallel, and each one is going through a different number of iterations of j. So you can see you actually need some load balancing here, because some of these are going through just one step, and some are going through n minus one steps. You know, it's basically the no amount of work div in every iteration of the outer loop here is different. I'm sorry? No, I equals one is where you want to start. Because you don't have to move the diagonal. Right, you only have to go across the, the top here. And for each of those, you know, copy it into the appropriate column. Flip it into the appropriate column. Flip the two things. Actually, transpose is one of these functions. I remember writing my first transpose function. And when I was done, I somehow had the identity. Because I basically made the loops go for I get from one to n and one to n and swap them. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I swap them, so I said, oh, that's a lot of work to compute the identity. <laughs> okay, no, you gotta make sure you only go through a triangular iteration space, okay, in order to make sure you swap, you know, and then swap, so, okay. In, this is an in-place swap. So that's Silk 4. That's basically it. There are some more facilities we'll talk about, but that's basically it for parallel programming in Silk++. The other part is how do you do it so that you get fast code, which we'll talk about. Now, uh, Silk has um, serial semantics, and what that means is, uh, unlike some of the other ones, it's kind of the, what OpenMP was aspiring to do. Um, the idea is that if I, for example, here, delete the, these two keywords, I get a C++ code, and that code is always a legal way to execute this parallel code. 
So the parallel code may have more behaviors if it's non-deterministic code, but always it's legal to do, to, to treat it as if it's just straight C++. So, and, and the reason for that is that really we're only granting permission for parallel execution. So even though I put in these keywords, I still can execute it serially if I wish, okay? They don't command parallel execution. To obtain the serialization, you can do it by hand by just defining a silk four to be four and the silk spawn and silk sync to be empty, okay? Or there's a switch to the C silk plus plus compiler that does that for you automatically and is probably the preferred way of doing it, okay? But the idea is conceptually, you know, you can sprinkle in these keywords and if you don't want it anymore, fine. You can, you want to compile it with the uh, straight C compiler, it's better to use the Silk++ compiler to do it, but if you wanted to, you know, ship it off to somebody else, you could just do these sharp defines and they could compile it with their compiler and it would be the same as a serial C++ code. So the um, Silk++ concurrency platform allows the programmer to express potential parallelism in an application. Okay, so it says where is the parallelism? It doesn't say how to schedule it, it says where is it? And then it gets mapped onto the, um, at runtime, dynamically mapped onto the processor cores. Okay, and the way that it does the mapping is, is mathematically provably a good way of doing it. Okay, and uh, if you take one of my graduate courses, I can teach you how that works. Okay, uh, we'll do a little bit of study of simple scheduling, but the, the actual uh, scheduler it uses is more, um, more involved, but we'll, we'll cover it a little bit. Here's the components of the Silk++ platform on a single slide, okay? So let me just say what they are. The first one is the keywords, so you get to put things in there, and if you elide them, you know, or, or create the serialization, then you uh, get the C++ code or C code for which then you can run your regression tests and demonstrate you have some good single threaded program. Alternatively, you can send it through the Silk++ compiler which is based on a conventional compiler. In our case, it'll be GCC. You can link that with the hyper object library which we'll talk about when we start talking about synchronization. Produces a binary. If you run that binary on the runtime system, you can also run it through the regression test. And in particular, if you run it on the runtime system running on one core, it should behave identically to having run it through this path with just the serial code, okay? However, and of course you get exceptional performance, okay? These, I think, were originally marketing slides, <laughs> okay? However, there's also the fact that, that you may get what are called races in your code, which are bugs that will come up that won't occur in your serial code, but will occur in your parallel code, okay? And Silk has a race detector to detect those for which you can run parallel regression tests to produce your reliable multi-threaded code. And then the final piece of it is there's this thing called Silk View, which allows you to analyze the scalability of your software. So you can run, in fact, on a single core or on a small number of cores, and then you can predict how it's going to behave on a large number of cores, okay? So let's just uh, talk, to conclude here, talk about races, because they're the um, nasty, nasty, nasty thing we get into parallel programming. And then next time we'll get deeper into the uh, Silk technology itself. So the most basic kind of race there is is what's called a determinacy race. Because if you have one of these things, your program is, becomes non-deterministic, okay? Doesn't do the same thing every time. A determinacy race occurs when two logically parallel instructions access the same memory location and at least one of the instructions performs a write, performs a store to that location, okay? So here's an example. I have a Silk 4 here where I am both branches of which are incrementing x, so right? This is basically going, the index is going i equals zero and i equals one. And then it's asserting that x equals two. If I run this serially, the assertion passes, okay? But when I run it in parallel, it may not produce a two. 
it can produce a one. Let's see why that is. So the way to understand this code is to think about its execution in terms of a dependency DAG. So here I have my initialization of X. Then once that's done, the silk for loop allows me to do two things at a time, B and C, which are both incrementing X. And then I assert that X equals two, okay, when they're both done. Okay, so that, because that's the semantics of the silk for. Okay, so let's see where the race occurs. So remember that it occurs when I have two logically parallel instructions that access the same memory location. Here it's going to be location X. At least one of them performs a write. Execution. So if we actually look closer, I want to expand this into this larger thing. Because as you know, X plus plus is not done as a, on a memory location, is not done as a single instruction. It's done as a load, X into a register, increment the register, and then store the value back in, okay? And meanwhile, there's another register on another processor, presumably, that's doing the same thing. So this is the one I want to look at. This is just a, you know, zooming in, if you will, on, on this dependency graph to look at a little bit finer grain at what's actually happening one step at a time. So the determinacy race, recall, occurs this is, by the way, something I'm going to say again. You should memorize, okay? So you should know what this is. You should be able to say what a determinacy race is, okay? It's when you have two instructions that are both accessing the same location and one of them performs right. And here I have that. This guy is in parallel. He's being stored to, he's being stored to here. This is also a race. He's being reading it and this guy is writing it. So let's see what can happen and why, what can go wrong here. So here's my value X in memory, and here's my two registers on presumably two different processors. So one thing is that you can typically, and this is not quite um, the case with real hardware, but an abstraction of the hardware is that you can treat the parallel execution from a logical point of view as if you're interleaving instructions from the different processors, okay? We're gonna talk in three or four lectures about where that isn't the right abstraction, but it is close to the right abstraction. So here, basically, we execute statement one, which causes x to become zero. Now let's execute statement two. That causes r1 to become zero, okay? Then I can increment that. It becomes a one. All well and good. But now if the next logical thing that happens is that r2 is uh, set to the value of x, Okay, then it becomes zero, then we increment it, and now he stores back one into x, and now this guy stores one back into x. And notice that now we go to the assertion, and we assert that it's two, and it's not the two. Okay, it's a one. Okay, because we lost one of the updates. Now the reason race bugs are really pernicious is notice that if I had executed this whole branch, and then this whole branch, I get the right answer. Or if I executed this whole branch, and then this whole branch, I get the right answer. The only time I don't get the right answer is when those two things happen to interleave just so. And that's what happens with uh, race conditions generally, is that they are, you can run your code a million times and not see the bug, and then run it once and it crashes. Okay, you know, out in the field. Or what's happened is there have been race bugs, respons race bugs responsible for failure of space shuttle to launch, okay, of the North American blackout of 2000, what, 2001, three? It wasn't that long ago, it was like 10 years ago. We had a big blackout caused by a race condition in, in the code run by the, uh, the power companies, okay? There have been medical instruments that have fried people killed them and maimed them because of race conditions. Okay, these are really serious bugs. Okay, question. When you said, so the only time that that code executes properly is when it actually executes serially? It could execute in parallel if it happened that these guys executed before these guys. If you think of a larger context where I had a whole bunch of these things and I have two routines where they're both incrementing x in the middle of great big parallel programs, 
It could be that they're executing perfectly well in parallel, but they happen to, those two small sections of code happen to execute like this or like this, then, then you're gonna end up with it executing correctly. But if they execute sort of at the same time, it would not necessarily behave correctly. So there, there are um, sort of two types of races that people talk about, a read race and a write race. So suppose you have two instructions that access a location X, and suppose that A is parallel to B. Well, if A and B are both reads, you get no race. That's good, okay? Because there's no way. But if one is a read and one is a write, then one of them is gonna see a different value depending upon whether it occurred before and after the write. Or if they both are writing, one can lose a value, okay? So, um, so these are uh, uh, read races and this is a write race. So we say that two sections of code are independent if they have no determinacy races between them. So for example, this piece of code is incrementing y, and this is incrementing x, and y is not equal to x. Those are independent pieces of code. So to avoid races, you wanna make sure that the iterations of your silk four are independent. So what's going on in one iteration is different from what's going on in another, that you're not writing something in one that you're using in the next, for example. Between a silk spawn and the corresponding silk sink, the code of the spawn child should be independent of the code of the parent, okay? Including any code executed by additional spawned or called children. So it's basically saying when you spawn something off, don't then go and do something that's gonna modify the same locations. You really wanna modify different locations, okay? And read, it's fine if they both read the same locations, but it's not fine for one of them to read and one of them to write. Um, one thing here to understand is that when you spawn a function, the arguments are actually executed serially before the actual spawn occurs. So you evaluate the arguments, you set it all up, then you call the, then you spawn the function, okay? So the actual spawn occurs after the evaluation of arguments. So they're evaluated in the parent. Uh, machine word size matters, okay? So this is generally the case for, uh, for races. By the way, races are not just silk stuff. This races occur in all of these concurrency platforms. The issue of under, we're, I'm illustrating with silk because that's what we're gonna be using in our um, labs and so forth. So it turns out machine word side matters and you can have races in uh, packed data structures. So for example, if you, on some machines, if you declare a uh, char A and char B, okay, uh, in a struct, then updating X and, and XB in parallel may cause a race because they're both actually operating on a word basis. Now on the Intel architectures, uh, that doesn't happen because Intel supports atomic updates of single bytes, okay? So you, so you don't have to worry about it. But if you were accessing bits within a word, you could end up with the same thing. You access bit five and bit three, okay? You think you're actually independently, but in fact, you're reading the whole word or the whole byte in order to access it. The technology that you're gonna be using fortunately comes with a race detector, which you will find invaluable for debugging your stuff, okay? And so this is kind of like a Valgrind for races, okay? So what you do is, uh, what's good about this race detector is it provides a rock hard guarantee. If you have a deterministic program that on a given input could possibly behave any differently from your serial program, okay, from the, from the corresponding serial program, if you got rid of the uh, parallel keywords, this tool, Silkscreen, guarantees to report and localize the offending race. Okay, it'll tell you you've got a race between this location and that location. And it's up to you to find it and fix it, but it can tell you that. Okay, it employs regression test methodology where you, the programmer provides test inputs. So if you don't provide test inputs to elicit the race, you still can have a bug. But if you have a test input that in any way could behave differently than the serial execution, bingo, it'll tell you, okay? It runs, uh, it identifies a bunch of things involved in race, including a stack trace. It runs off the binary executable using what's called dynamic instrumentation. So that's kind of like Valgrind, except that it actually does this as it's running, 
okay? It uses a uh, technology called PIN, which you can uh, read about, P-I-N, uh, which is a uh, nice platform for doing um, code rewriting and analysis on the fly. It runs about 20 times slower than real time. So um, you basically use it for debugging. So um, we will, um, the, uh, the, the first part of project four is basically coming up to speed this tech, with this technology. And so there's some good things. And that's going to be available tomorrow. Is that what we decided? Yeah, that'll be available tomorrow. OK? So this is actually, this is tons of fun. Yeah, most uh, people in most places don't get to play with parallel technology like this. <laughs>